Hello, everybody. Please have a seat. Welcome to the White House. Uh, I am going to be brief because on a night like tonight, my job is to get out of the way and let the professionals do their job. Uh, I, I do want to start by thanking our extraordinary performers for taking time out of their busy schedules to be with us. Uh, I also want to recognize the President's Committee on the Arts and the Humanities for putting on this event and for everything they do to support the arts. You know, the, the power of poetry is that everybody experiences it differently. There are no rules for what makes a great poem. Uh, understanding it isn't just about metaphor or meter. Uh, instead, a great poem is one that resonates with us, that challenges us, and that teaches us something about ourselves and the world that we live in. Uh, as Rita Dove says, if poetry doesn't affect you on some level that cannot be explained in words, then the poem hasn't done its job. Uh, also known as, it don't mean a thing. If <laughs> it ain't got that swing. That's a little ad lib there. Um, for thousands of years, people have been drawn to poetry in a very personal way including me. Uh, in the spirit of full disclosure, uh, I actually submitted a couple of poems to my college literary magazine, and you'll be pleased to know that I will not be reading them tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but as a nation built on freedom of expression, poets have always played an important role in telling our American story. It was after the bombing of Fort McHenry during the War of 1812, that a young lawyer named Francis Scott Key penned the poem that would become our national anthem. The Statue of Liberty has always welcomed the huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Soldiers going off to fight in World War II were giving, given books of poetry for comfort and inspiration. And whenever uh, our nation has faced uh, a great tragedy, whether it was the loss of a civil rights leader, the crew of a space shuttle, or the thousands of Americans uh, that were lost on a clear September day, we've turned to poetry when we can't find uh, quite the right words to express what we're feeling. So tonight, we continue that tradition by hearing from some of our greatest, as well as some of our newest, poets. Uh, Billy Collins, who is here with us, calls poetry the oldest form of travel writing because it takes us to places we can only imagine. So in that spirit, I'd like everyone to sit back or sit on the edge of your seats uh, and enjoy the journey. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Rita Dove. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. President and Mrs. Obama, for bringing poetry into the White House and letting us sing and soar for this evening. I'd like to read two poems. Both of them are love poems of a sort. The first is a love poem to librarians, because it was in the public libraries of this country where I first uh, really had the world open up to me. This is my special Branch Library in my hometown of Ohio, Akron, Ohio, Maple Valley Branch Library, 1967. For a 15-year-old, there was plenty to do. Browse the magazines, slip into the adult section to see what vast tristesse was born of rush hour traffic, decolletes, and the plague of too much money. There was so much to discover how to lay out a road, the language of flowers, and the place of women in the tribe of Moshe. There were equations elegant as a French twist, 
fractal geometry's unwinding maple leaf. I could follow, step by step, the slow disclosure of a pineapple jello mold, or take the path of Harold's purple crayon through the bedroom window and onto a lavender spill of stars. Oh, I could walk any aisle and smell wisdom, put a hand out to touch the rough curve of bound leather, the harsh parchment of dreams. As for the improbable librarian with her salt and paprika upsweep, her British accent and sweater clip, mom of a kid I knew from school, I'd go up to her desk and ask for help on bareback rodeo or binary codes, phonics, gestalt theory, lead poisoning in the late Roman Empire, the play of light in Dutch Renaissance painting. I would claim to be researching pre-Columbian pottery or Chinese foot binding, but all I wanted to know was, tell me what you've read that keeps that half smile afloat above the collar of your impeccable blouse. So I read Gone with the Wind because it was big and haiku because they were small. <laughs> I studied history for its rhapsody of dates, lingered over cubist art for the way it showed all sides of a guitar at once. All the time in the world was there and sometimes all the world on a single page. As much as I could hold on my plastic card's imprint, I took greedily six books, six volumes of bliss, the stuff we humans are made of, words and sighs and silence, ink and whips, Brahma and cosine, corsets and poetry and blood sugar levels. I carried it home past five blocks of aluminum siding and the old garage where, on its boarded up doors, someone had scrawled, I can eat an elephant if I take small bites. <laughs> yes, I said to no one in particular, that's what I'm going to do. This is a more traditional love poem, heart to heart. It's neither red nor sweet. It doesn't melt or turn over, break or harden, so it can't feel pain, yearning, regret. It doesn't have a tip to spin on. It isn't even shapely, just a thick clutch of muscle, lopsided, mute. Still, I feel it inside its cage, sounding a dull tattoo. I want, I want, but I can't open it. There's no key. I can't wear it on my sleeve or tell you from the bottom of it how I feel. Here, it's all yours now, but you'll have to take me too. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Goldsmith. Thank you, thank you. You know, we've had a terrific day of poetry here at the White House, and I want to thank the First Lady for hosting a workshop this afternoon for, what was it, 150 high school kids? And they got up and they read it was so beautiful, I wanted to cry. I mean, it was really remarkable. So thank you for hosting that. It was really a great event. So meaningful. OK, so tonight, I'll be reading three short excerpts from poems about the Brooklyn Bridge. Now, the first excerpt I'm going to read, of course, is by Walt Whitman. Uh, it's called Crossing Brooklyn Ferry. And it was written in 1856, nearly 30 years before the bridge was built, right? And so in it, 
Whitman describes crossing the East River by ferry in the exact spot where the bridge stands today. And moving forward 75 years, the second excerpt will be from the poem To Brooklyn Bridge, uh, written in 1930 by the modernist American poet Hart Crane. And here the bridge serves as a spiritual metaphor comprised of a series of fleeting images and emotions that refer to the bridge, but they never describe the bridge, okay? And finally, uh, I'll be reading two excerpts from my book, everything's very short, uh, Traffic, <laughs> <laughs> written in 2007, which is a transcription of every traffic report given every 10 minutes on the ones over the course of 24 hours on a uh, New York City AM radio station. Now, here the Brooklyn Bridge, the Grand Brooklyn Bridge, is reduced to being a bit player in a series of monuments that are evaluated not for their spirituality or humanity or significance in any way, but merely on how fast or how slow they get you to where you're going. Okay, so the first is the Whitman piece uh, from Crossing Brooklyn Ferry, written in 1856. Flood tide below me, I watch you face to face. Clouds of the west, sun there, half an hour high. I also see you face to face. Crowds of men and women attired in the usual costumes. How curious you are to me. On the ferry boats, the hundreds and hundreds that cross, returning home, are more curious to me than you suppose. And you that shall cross from shore to shore years hence are more to me and more in my meditations than you might suppose. What is it then between us? What is the count of the scores or hundreds of years between us? Whatever it is, it avails not, distance avails not, and place avails not. The second piece says uh, Hart Crane, an excerpt from To Brooklyn Bridge from 1930. Again, the traffic lights that skim thy swift, unfractioned idiom, immaculate sigh of stars, beating thy path, condense eternity and we have seen night lifted in thine arms. O oh, sleepless as the river under thee, vaulting the sea, the prairie's dreaming sod, unto us lowly lists sometimes sweep, descend, and of the curve ship lend a myth to God. And now finally, uh, two pieces from traffic. Uh, they are two pieces that are 10 minutes apart. The first one is from 421 in the afternoon. <laughs> and we are still going to have delays to get through a, a pretty bad rush hour. Uh, we've got major delays on uh, 7th and 8th Avenues as you uh, make your way through the Midtown area. 7th Avenue delays begin right out of Central Park all the way down to Times Square. Broadway's not impacted. Obviously, 9th and 10th Avenue seeing more traffic as well, but not as bad as uh, headed through the Times Square area. Meanwhile, on the east side, it's a torture test because a lot of the uh, side streets are taking a beating, especially through the 40s and 50s. That will impact traffic at the 59th Street Bridge, which is jammed coming into Manhattan. Right now, you've also got jam ups on the Brooklyn Bridge, bumper to bumper to Brooklyn, but the lower roadway is wide open. The Brooklyn Bridge is swamped. The FDR Drive's not looking good either, bumper to bumper right off the Manhattan Bridge. Meanwhile, the West Side Tunnel delays begin in the 70s, and they go all the way south down to the Battery Tunnel. There's one more, and, and it gets worse. <laughs> 10 minutes later, at 4.31 in the afternoon, remember how bad it was yesterday? 
It's starting all over again. The uh, east side delays begin at the Triborough. It's pretty much one long line now, all the way to the Battery. The west side delays to the Battery, building back at the Boat Basin at 79th Street. We've got a ton of interior traffic in Midtown. 7th Avenue, Times Square, that's the delay. That's where it's all going. It's coming out of Central Park Broadway, and 8th Avenue are going to be impacted by that. On the east side, the side streets are packed through the 40s and 50s, and that's why 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and Park Avenue right now are an absolute mess. So trying to get around Midtown, just like yesterday, is not going to be easy at all. Across the East River, already a ton of traffic each way on the Brooklyn Bridge. Now the Manhattan Bridge is bumper to bumper coming into Manhattan, jam-packed on the upper roadway to Brooklyn. The ro lower roadway is also a mess. 59th Street Bridge is getting real bad. The belt is jammed up east off the Verrazano. Some type of problem on the way out to Coney Island. And uh, right now, heavy transit delays. Be sure to budget extra travel time, taking the LIRR out of Penn Station. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Allison Knowles. I'm so honored to be here. The first piece I'm going to do is called Shoes of Your Choice. I first performed this in New Jersey 48 years ago. And haven't our shoes served us well? an object poem. <laughs> These are my formal shoes. I've had them for many years. And it reminds me a lot of the time when I was growing up. And I had then, at that time, at 14, I had a size 11 foot. And in Scarsdale, New York, there was no way to fit an 11 foot. So my parents would go in yearly into uh, New York City to something called tall size shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, they would buy me uh, some, some shoes. Uh, I'm very uh, delighted to say that many tall women I meet now have no trouble to, to buy a decent size shoe. Uh, the salesman, when I went to buy these shoes, said, showing me a pair of very ugly pumps, young woman, someone in your position cannot be fussy. <laughs> I'd like to read <clears throat> just a little of a poem called The House of Dust, which uh, is one of the first computer poems ever done, <laughs> if not the first computer poem, so I'm going to read you a little of this. <laughs> uh, this is programmed by a wonderful composer in California, James Tenney. A House of Brick by a river. 
using candles, inhabited by children and old people. A house of tin in a hot climate, using electricity, inhabited by little boys. A house of wood on an island, using natural light, inhabited by women wearing all colors. A house of discarded clothing in dense woods, using electricity, inhabited by collectors of all types. A house of brick in a green, mossy terrain, using natural light, inhabited by all races of men wearing predominantly red clothing. A house of dust in a deserted airport, using candles, inhabited by collectors of all types. A house of weeds on an island, using electricity, inhabited by friends and enemies. A house of discarded clothing in a deserted airport, using all available lighting, inhabited by people who eat a great deal. A house of roots in a green, mossy terrain, using electricity, inhabited by lovers. This is a bean turner. It's made of flax and azuki beans. It's the invention I have for sound poetry. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Jill Scott. I just had to make sure I could get up the steps. I don't normally have a computer, but I do today. So, let's see how this works. Um, I'm excited. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm really geeked. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, I've been concerned over the years wondering why so many people had HIV with all the information that's given and uh, the, the constant billboards and there's, you, you see what happens, you know? Unprotected sex equals Danger. So, uh, in me trying to figure out how it happens, I, um, I wrote a poem some years ago. It's called One Second of Warped Security, so that I could understand it. And it goes like this I, 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 I was chilling with him on a Sunday. It was a good day, all day making love day. I, 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 I didn't think that I, I could feel so comfortable and secure, but I, 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 I did. And H-I-I-I-V came to visit. <sighs> I don't know what this is called yet, <laughs> uh, but it goes like this. Oh, children, please write. Paste your thoughts on our thoughts for a while. 
Because folks get mazed in the selling and buying of things, and one fine day they find they've forgotten how to cry and marked absent when it's time to smile. They miss the whole damn point. That love is meant to be excessively praised and hurts are to be forgiven, understood, so that moving on can be a forward movement and the end result is just good. Right, children, right. Let the words be purged from your souls high and your guttural deep. Be not afraid, because humanity needs reminding. Real living is in the now nows, and there is much to be touched and much more to be seen. Investigate the alls of everything. Right, baby, because I was born a day or two after you, and the prescription in my glass has changed a thousand times. I need your fresh, your sublime fascination. I need your eyes. Write for me, love, please. Not a performance piece. Actors act, but you are a poet. You write poetry. The dancing of words, the fly in the soup, the pain in the peace. You explore the life, the things on the things. Elders' fingers, ugly ways, bugs on wings, the reasons the dancers dance the reasons the singers sing. Write, children, write. Write angry, show, define, be outraged, mark me with a red pen when I do not protect you, when I give up, when I give in, when fear is holding my arms back, when ego is controlling, humiliating me. Make me go inside myself to straighten up, wash, and do some ironing. Write, children, be my superhero poet. Wear your cape inside the diamond on your chest, a large capital P. Languish in the power of words. Tell the stories. Touch, reach, fly over the lies and confusion of the time. Save me. Write, children. Write. Please. <laughs> I'm cheating. You don't get an opportunity to be at the White House very often and, and say a poem, so I'm, I'm going to read another one if that's all right. I'm sure the Secret Service will come yank me up and tell me to get out of here if I'm supposed to. This poem is called Woman Manifesto. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Clearly, I am not some lump of flesh squeezed into tight jeans. I am active brain and lip-smacking peach deep, sometimes too aggressive in its honesty and heart sweet, that loves wholly and completely whomever it may choose. I am not gonna lie and pacify. I am arms to hold. I am lips to speak. I am a G. Strong legs that stroll off the 33 bus or out of a money green phantom comfortably. Knees that bend to pray, clean from Ajax washings. Hair that is thick and soft, thighs that betweeks. An all amazing grand prize. <laughs> I am eyes that sing, smile that brightens, touch that rings and supplies euphoric release. I am a grand, dumb, queen, beast. <laughs> I am warm. I am peace from the roads of Botswana to 23rd Street, from the inside, third eye, ever watching this wicked, wicked system of things I do see. I am friend to pen, lover of strong women, a diamond to men. I am curious and interested like children. I welcome the wise to teach, appreciator of my culture, thick, not from just bone dense and eat. There is a rhythm in my ways and a practice in my seek, and yes, I do crave the rhythm of my space, with a man that rejoices in God's grace. With faith, I do hear to listen. Two hands that fist when force pushes to, to shove and your ego won't submit, and I am gifted. I am all of this, and indeed, the shizzin'it. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, I am not just an act. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, Moira Bass and Yusuf Biaz. Hi, I'm Moira, and this is one of my poems called Shana. Well, we all know then, don't we? We're all ready for the worst. Shana, don't you give in. I won't lie to you, girl, and I ain't gonna tell no stories, cause there sure as heck is always gonna be another heartbreak. But who said there ain't gonna be someone who will just keep on mending? You just keep those music notes and stars floating around your head and ignore them moans and groans. Shana, don't you give in. None of our lives is filled with fluffy bunnies and kept promises, and above all, true love. Don't you go pretending, child, but Shana, don't you give in. Your prince will come, but don't you go searching too early or it'll jinx your luck. He's awaiting somewhere. Just hold your dang horses. Just cause one left you, pshaw. I'll be betting that there's gonna be 20 seas in a moment when they find out. So dry them tears, stupid girl. No one needs the waters to rise. Shayna, don't you give in. You ain't one of them teeter-totter, blonde-headed, heavens to Betsy, simple-minded, air-headed chicks who's always checking their hair in the mirror. What do they care of the future? No, you got promised, child. Shayna, don't you give in. That's why they like you, you know? Now get your sensible head out of the low-hanging clouds. Move on and come out of this morning. No one wants a girl who cries during math class, caring more about her problems than the ones in the book. I love you, girl. Shayna, don't you give in. Good evening. My name is Yusuf Biaz, and for the past two years I've been involved in the National Poetry Recitation Contest called Poetry Out Loud, sponsored by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Poetry Foundation. And tonight I'll be reciting a poem written by Sharon Olds called Mrs. Krikorian. And it's Sharon Olds' way of honoring a wonderful teacher she must have had in sixth grade. And it seems that she wasn't very well behaved in sixth grade. And to be honest, neither was I. And the poem really spoke to me. And it was the first poem that piqued my interest in participating in the competition. So here it is. Mrs. Krikorian by Sharon Olds. She saved me. When I arrived in sixth grade, a known criminal. The new teacher asked me to stay after school the first day. She said, I've heard about you. She was a tall woman with a deep crevice between her breasts and a large, calm nose. She said, this is a special library pass. As soon as you finish your hour's work, that hour's work that took 10 minutes, and then the devil glanced into the room and found me empty, a house standing open. You can go to the library. Every hour, I'd zip through the work in a dash and slip out of my seat as if out of God's side and sail down to the library, solo through the empty, powerful halls, flash my pass, and stroll over to the dictionary to look up the most interesting word I knew. Spank. <laughs> Dipping two fingers into the jar of library paste to suck that tart mucilage as I came to the page with the cocker spaniel silks curling up like the fine steam of the body. After spank and breast, I'd move on to Abe Lincoln and Helen Keller, safe in their goodness till the bell, thanks to Mrs. Krikorian 
amiable giantess with the kind eyes. When she asked me to write a play and direct it, and it was a flop, and I hid in the coat closet, she brought me a candy cane as you lay a peppermint on the tongue and the worm will come up out of the bowel to get it. And so I was emptied of Lucifer and filled with school glue and Eros and Amelia Earhart, saved by Mrs. Krikorian. And who had saved Mrs. Krikorian? When the Turks came across Armenia, who slid her into the belly of a quilt? Who locked her in a chest? Who mailed her to America? And that one who saved her, and that one who saved her, to save the one who saved Mrs. Krikorian, who was standing there on the sill of sixth grade, a wide-hipped angel smoky hair standing up weightless all around her head. I end up owing my soul to so many, to the Armenian nation. One more soul, someone jammed behind a stove, drove deep into a crack in a wall, shoved under a bed. I would wake up in the morning under my bed, not knowing how I had got there, and lie in the dusk, the dust balls beside my face round and ashen, shining slightly with the eerie comfort of what is neither good nor evil. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Billy Collins. Good evening. What a thrill and an honor it is to be here. And uh, how grateful we are to uh, the President and Mrs. Obama for hosting this, for drawing attention to poetry in America. Uh, I'm only sorry that so many of my fellow poets uh, could not be here to join us tonight. Well, not really. <laughs> uh, it's, um, it's important that I'm here. Um, one of my poet friends uh, phoned me earlier in the week and said, you know, you're going you're to make so many poets jealous going to the White House. And I said, well, isn't that the whole point of writing? I mean. <laughs> And then he reminded me that the point of writing was to marry truth and beauty. So hats off to him, but he's not, he's not, he's not here either. So. Well, I was told originally that I could read only one poem, but I pulled a former poet laureate privilege and I've extended it to two poems. So uh, it's customary toward the end of poetry readings to give what is called the two poem warning. And, but I'm going to start by giving you the two-poem warning, so you've been warned. Um, the first poem is called Forgetfulness, and it's a meditation on, on forgetting, and it begins uh, with uh, something called literary amnesia, that is, forgetting uh, books you've read. Uh, forgetfulness. The name of the author is the first to go, followed obediently by the title, the plot, the heartbreaking conclusion, the entire novel, which suddenly becomes one you have never read, never even heard of. It is as if one by one the memories you used to harbor decided to retire to the southern hemisphere of the brain, to a little fishing village where there are no phones. 
Long ago, you kissed the names of the nine muses goodbye, and you watched the quadratic equation pack its bag. <laughs> and even now, as you memorize the order of the planet, something else is slipping away, a state flower, perhaps, the address of an uncle, the capital of Paraguay. Whatever it is you are struggling to remember, it is not poised on the tip of your tongue, not even lurking in some obscure corner of your spleen. It has floated away down a dark mythological river whose name begins with an L, <laughs> as far as you can recall. <laughs> well, on your own way to oblivion, where you'll join those who have forgotten even how to swim and how to ride a bicycle. No wonder you rise in the middle of the night to look up the date of a famous battle in a book on war. No wonder the moon in the window seems to have drifted out of a love poem that you used to know by heart. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And this is a poem about uh, something children do in the summertime at camp, and it's called The Lanyard. The other day as I was ricocheting slowly off the pale blue walls of this room, bouncing from typewriter to piano, from bookshelf to an envelope lying on the floor, I found myself in the L section of the dictionary where my eyes fell upon the word lanyard. No cookie nibbled by a French novelist could send one more suddenly into the past, a past where I sat at a workbench at a camp by a deep Adirondack lake, learning how to braid thin plastic strips into a lanyard, a gift for my mother. I had never seen anyone use a lanyard, or wear one if that's what you did with them, but that did not keep me from crossing strand over strand again and again until I had made a boxy red and white lanyard for my mother. She gave me life and milk from her breasts, and I gave her a lanyard. <clears throat> she nursed me in many a sick room, lifted teaspoons of medicine to my lips, set cold face cloths on my forehead, then led me out into the airy light and taught me to walk and swim, and I in turn presented her with a lanyard. <laughs> Here are thousands of meals, she said, and here is clothing and a good education. <laughs> and here is your lanyard, I replied, <laughs> which I made with a little help from a counselor. <laughs> here is a breathing body and a beating heart, strong legs, bones and teeth, and two clear eyes to read the world, she whispered. And here, I said, is the lanyard <laughs> I made at camp. And here, I wish to say to her now, is a smaller gift, not the archaic truth that you can never repay your mother, but the rueful admission that when she took the two-tone lanyard from my hands, I was as sure as a boy could be that this useless, worthless thing I wove out of boredom would be enough to make us even. Thank you. A spectacular evening. I want to make sure that uh, all of you uh, have a chance to give one more big round of applause to Jill Scott, <laughs> Steve Martin and the Steep Canyon Rangers, Amy Mann, Allison Knowles, Kenny Goldsmith, Rita Dove, Common. Billy Collins, Yusef Biez, and Myra Bass. Give them all a big round of applause. That's the power of poetry. <laughs> <laughs>